So you're interested in steel design and some rules of thumb that you can use to help you more effectively size up a structure. But before we start, it's interesting to understand what the difference between design and rules of thumb are and where you can use them. What design, as the name suggests, is a detailed calculation. So you've done all the load rundowns to work out what stresses are inside the columns. Actually calculate the bending moments in the beams that you're designing and size them up from either tables or from doing detailed calculations. Where rules of thumb are more of these basic back of the hand calculations that allow you to simplify these formulas and then come up with an approximate size or weight of the structure that you're designing. For example, if you've ever been in one of those meetings and the architects are suddenly framing up the building that you're designing, and then pointing to you saying, what size does that be need to be? What size does the column need to be? This is a perfect example of where you can use rules of thumb. Other areas, for example, are also when you're trying to frame up a structure, giving that first guess of a size, or even you're checking someone else's drawings. You're looking at the spans and going, is that the right member? You can use these rules of thumb as an approximation to see whether they've actually sized up the structure effectively. Now, they're not always true, so you do need to back them up with detailed calculations but it allows you to quickly accurately pinpoint areas that may have errors or faults or some areas where you may even have additional efficiencies that you may be able to achieve. Other areas where rules of thumb come in handy as well is what type of grids that you need to be more effective and how should you frame up your structure. So if you had a free open slather, where should you be putting those columns? So I'll be starting off with some basic framing concepts about how to frame up a steel frame structure some myths that you may have actually had when you're designing structures, and this has probably come from concrete design. Then I'll be going through like span to depth ratios. This will be both for composite design and for standard steel structures, roughly sizing up columns and through portal frames and connections. So hopefully I have links down the bottom that you better skip through different areas that you may be interested in, but it'll cover the broad gamut of steel design. Now let's get into it. So as I was saying, we're going to start off with some basic rules when we're framing up structures. And this is where some misconceptions may have come in. So when you're framing up a design, through many iterations, you'll find that the basic grid line, especially for steel structures, is a rule of like 7.5 metres by 10, or 4 to 3, where secondary members are your longer members, so your joist members, and your primary members are in your shorter direction. As you generally have it more of your secondary members, they can generally span further as they have less load on them where the primary members are the ones that are working harder, are typically better in those shorter directions. And when you're framing up the design for those columns, engineers generally like to avoid cantilevers. Now this is something that's potentially come about from concrete design, as you need to put additional steel either in the top or bottom of your structure to be able to design for those bending moments. Where steel is symmetrical by nature, so the bending moment on the hogging region is the same as the bending moment in the sagging region. Is the, So when we're designing it, if we're just designing as a simply supported beam, we're only using half the potential member capacity that we can have. So what we can do is introduce cantilevers, and that brings up your negative moment and puts in a positive moment in your design. So it allows you to balance out that load to more effectively gauge both the negative and positive region capacities of your beam, making it more effective. So what type of ratio is typically good here for cantilevers? Well, this is a typically a one third ratio. So one third of your backspan would be more effective into your cantilever. So for example, if you've got a beam for, with a backspan of nine meters, a three meter cantilever will make it more effective to help balance out those forces. Now, another key consideration when you're looking at this, especially for efficient design, is whether the introduction of that backspan means that you need to have moment connections. Now, these are costly elements. So this is preferably when you've got your cantilevers, if you can get a single span of beam that goes over the top of the column, so you don't need to have those costly moment connections that are either through bolted or welded joints. If you're enjoying this rules of thumb on steel design, don't forget to bolt down that like button. Not only does it help me out, but also encourages me to keep making more content for you. Now let's keep going with the rules of thumb on steel design. Another consideration when you're framing up a structure, especially a really large one, is thermal contraction and expansion. And we all know steel, especially when it heats up, expands, and when it cools down, it contracts. This means we need to allow for that thermal movement inside the structure through a series of movement joints. In rough designs, especially for roof structures, is typically where you see this. Roughly every 150 meters, you need to have some sort of movement joint so you don't have that stress from that overexpansion causing damage to your structure. Now, in more extreme environments, this may change, but typically under normal conditions, every 150 meters, 
this is the spot where you want to have those movement joints in. When you start those design meetings, architects are normally more concerned about the depth of the floor than the location of your columns. So when you're preliminary sizing up a structure, span to depth ratios are really your friend. So we're going through a series of these. We're starting off with floor joists, and typically they're a span to depth ratio of somewhere between 18 to 20. And you typically have a maximum span of about 17 meters, and you typically want to try and keep them around eight to 17 if you can. When you're getting up those bigger spans, they go from what is typically a deflection governed design to a vibration governed design. So a quick rule of thumb, and this is coming more from the timber code as well, is putting a one kilonewton point load in the middle of your joist and seeing how far it deflects. If you can deflect less than one mil, typically you will not have a vibration problem. Alternatively, you can also go through the rule of thumb for designing for vibration, which is 18 on square root of the deflection. Now you want to make sure that your frequencies are roughly around four to eight hertz, wherever possible for an efficient design. Obviously, the higher it's getting up, the more stiff the structure is, the lighter it is, the more likely you are to feel vibration through your design, which is not that great. So how else can you help reduce the vibration inside the structure? Wherever possible, continuous members will have a significant effect in reducing your vibration felt inside the design, as it allows you to get more mass engaged, and it also changes the modal frequency as well. So wherever possible on secondary members is having them continuous in the longer spans will not only help balance out those forces through having positive moments, but it will also help your frequencies as well. Now, if we're talking about those one and one third ratios of where you want your floor joists longer than primary members, what is the span depth ratio of a primary member? Well, this is somewhere between 13 to 15. And because they're working harder, they typically go to a maximum of about 12 meters. And again, just based on steel sizes, if you can try and keep them between that eight and 12 range is really where they're the most effective. And again, you have the same problem as they're in the same system and they can oscillate against each other. So on longer spanning connections, if you can get that continuity, it'll help you with your frequencies and just checking the vibration if you need to. As we're moving up the structure, so now we've got the floor structure, which is the same for every floor as we're going up. How about the roof? Well, the roof is typically lighter, so we typically get bigger spans. So in somewhere between that 14 to 18 range with a maximum span of about 17 meters for a typical roof truss. Where space frames are typically more efficient, they've got more depth there, so we can get a shallower structure. So we can typically span them at a ratio of about 20 to 24, and they go up to about 60 meters. So they're your really deeper structures. Where rafters, depending on the design that you're looking at, they're somewhere between 25 to 32 with a maximum depth ratio of 16 meters. So as we can see, we've got a range of structures in here and I will put them in the description below so you can go down and grab them if you need to. So we can see we can quickly size up the depth of a structure just by looking at the spans that we're dealing with and talking to the architect. Now, as we we're saying, these span depth ratios are really just to get you in the ballpark location. Another thing to consider, you now a lot of people when they're looking at it, they'll try and pre-camber out those dead loads. Now that's a good thing, it keeps the structure straight. You've got to be concerned about two things. You don't want to pre-camber any more than about 80% of dead load. Now, this is for two reasons, as a lot of the time you've potentially over-predicted your dead load, but also the connection details are typically a little bit stiffer, so you will get some fixity through those pin junctions. And from previous studies, we've found that deflections are roughly about 20% better than you're actually expecting. So this is why you don't want to over-pre-camber your design for two reasons, over-prediction of your dead loads and those connection details providing some fixity that help with the deflection ratio there. A lot of the time that with steel, especially for typical residential or office space, they pair this up with a concrete slab so you get a composite design. Composite design is great as it has the added benefits of concrete where you get those compressive forces where you need them and the tensile forces in the bottom where you need them for steel. So this will allow for about a 25 to 30% more efficient design giving efficient ranges somewhere between 22 to 25. It also allows for a lighter design as well through that efficiency. So you can save for upwards of 30 to 40% in steel weight. So if we're talking about different elements, so this would be just between your primary members and your secondary members, starting off with floor joists, there's somewhere between a span to depth ratio of 23 to 28 with a maximum span of about 18, where your primary beams that are working a bit harder again are slightly more efficient, so they're somewhere between 25 to 30. As you can see, they're about 30% better. And again, those primary members, you want to keep them to a maximum of about 14 to 12 meters wherever possible. One big concern when you're doing those 
composite actions is trying to get services through your design to keep that floor depth as small as possible. So it goes through some rules of thumb of allowing penetrations through your design. So circular openings, wherever possible, spacing them in about in the midpoint, around third points as well. So not where you've got those high bending moments and not where you've got those high shears. And provided you keep them small enough, you should be able to get the shear through there without additional plates. However, sometimes they require you to have large rectangular openings. Now this is where you want to place it in the middle third of the beam, wherever possible. And you want to make sure you're getting plates top and bottom, as you will have those additional bending actions that you need to deal with. So when you're spacing out these penetrations as well, you do not want them back to back to back. So there's a rough rule of thumb, you're spacing them out as roughly the depth of the beam or twice the depth of the beam, wherever possible. So now we've got either a composite design or steel design, we need to size up the columns that are inside our structure. Now this is a rough rule of thumb and you will need to base it on different types of elements. However, typically from designs, we've found that a 200 UC can get you up to about three stories, a 250 up to five, 300 up to eight, a 350 UC up to about 11 stories, and a 400 UC up to about 15. We can see we're going up about 50 mils for every four floors above that. Now this will be highly dependent on your grid, but from your typical grid, this is typically a good place to start. Another major element in steel design is portal frame structures. And now these are normally rigid structures. So you've got a rigid column plate connection that are acting both for sway frames and also helping with those deflections. Now these are most common in places where you've got big factories, warehouses, because of the efficiencies of the portal design. And if it's getting really large, sometimes you will need some internal columns as well. Another key feature in portal design is you typically have about an eighth of the span. So we've got a really long span, about an eighth of that span is the distance that horn should start to where it's finished. And it should be roughly the matching the same depth as the rafter. So by the time you get to the end of the haunch, you've doubled the depth of the section locally. Roofs, you need to make sure you're maintaining some sort of pitch to keep that efficiency. And that's somewhere between two degrees to three degrees. And your span to depth ratios of your rafters are upwards of span to 60, where your columns based on the height is roughly span on 50. So portal frames are highly efficient for these reasons, as you're getting those reversal of moments, both at the peak of it, because you're getting a point load here, you means you'll potentially get a reversal of moment at the top, and then you're getting the reversal of moment when you come into the column. So this is allowing you to have a more efficient structure based on its framing. Something that is most common, especially in steel design, is bolted connections. Now you have a series of bolted connections and typically when you're using fin plates, you wanna make sure that you're using an M20 bolt wherever possible and 8.8 grade. So as a rough rule of thumb, for anything less than about 450 mils, you can get a ray with about an eight thick fin plate, where when you're going above that, you do need to increase it up to about 10 mils and you're roughly matching the web thickness of the beam that you're designing for. And how many bolts you need in there? As a rough rule of thumb, it's the depth divided by 10. So if you've got a 450 beam, you roughly need four members, 500 beam, you need five, 600, you need six, for example. And we're just moving up from there. Another common thing is moment connections. And again, we're typically using that 8.8 grade and 20 grade bolt wherever possible. In your bigger sections, you will need to go up to your bigger bolt sections, such as this. And so, for example, up to a 24 diameter bolt or even bigger in really deep sections. As a rough rule of thumb, what size plates do you need for your moment connection? Well, it's really simple. Whatever the thickness of your bolt is, is roughly the thickness of your plate that you're bolting to. So this comes a really quick guide. So you've got a 32 thick bolt, you roughly need a 32 thick plate, or if you've got a 20 thick bolt, a 20 thick plate, and so on. Another common connection is welding. And welds can be highly efficient if used effectively. So wherever possible, you should try and use a six fillet weld. Now, why is that? Well, you see a six fillet weld only requires one pass of the welder to pass it on. Where if you're going up to those eight mil fillet welds, you need two passes, 10 mil, you need three. So you can see through the more passes, the more costly it gets. And obviously sight welding is even more costly again. So if you, wherever possible is trying to avoid the sight welding, bring everything to sight and bolting it up, but minimizing it wherever possible. And a rough rule of thumb for capacities. So if you're looking at the shear forces in design and running how long length the weld do you need? Well, a six fillet weld has about a capacity of about one kilonewton per millimeter. 
If you look down in the below description, you see I've got a link to a Patreon website. And I'd like to give a shout out to my first Patreon, Ben Sam, who signed up last week and has been asking me a series of questions through the website. So what does it give you? Well, it gives you more access to me and also gets you a shout out and gets you involved in the community that I'm hopefully building in the future. But if you are looking at other ways to help support me, I do also have affiliate links to Amazon websites. Now what that allows you to do is click on the link and buy something. It gives me a small commission, but it's at no cost to you. And if you haven't joined this content, don't forget to hit the like button, comment and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.